Welcome to worship on this beautiful morning, October 1st, 2023. Um, two names have been added to the prayer list since it was printed. Those names are Kenny Brewer and Lois Neely. Um, do have a number of announcements today, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, and also, we're going to be sharing this microphone with a number of people. Please, if you're having trouble hearing anyone, let us know, and we can, uh, we can make some uh, adjustments to make sure you can hear us. Um, first off, there is coffee hour today in the Fellowship Hall. It's already set up, so please make a detour on your way out today um, to grab some, uh, some goodies and coffee. Um, did everybody receive a bulletin and a communion cup on the way in? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, be sharing, uh, we'll be sharing communion at our seats at the appropriate time. Coming up in two weeks, October 15th will be a very special day. Uh, it'll be Harvest Home that day, and it will also be Bring a Friend Sunday. Um, in fact, I have some brochures for you to hand out to your friends to invite them to come along. So, Alex and Emma, could you hand these out to everybody, please? Thank you. Some of you might have gotten one on the way in, and that's okay. Um, so please find a friend and, and hand, hand this out to them to invite them to join us that day. There will be a couple surprises in worship that day, and you know that surprises in worship can be lots of fun here. So please bring, uh, bring your friends along. There will also be a luncheon that day on the 15th, um, which we hope you and your friends can stay for. At that luncheon, there will be a presentation by the task force to explain um, all of the, uh, the suggested changes that they've, they've, uh, they're bringing forward. Our own members, Bob and Erica Schutte, were severely impacted by the sto one of the storms that came through in July uh, when a bridge that they used to get to their house was destroyed. Um, the bridge is currently being rebuilt, however, since it's a private bridge and because there has no not been an official disaster declaration, um, the Schutte's and their neighbors are on the hook for the cost of that bridge, and Bob and Erica's portion comes to $37,000. So Lutheran Disaster Response is helping to raise some funds, but I'd also like to see us help as well. Um, for the next four weeks, a special offering plate will be available in the Narthex. Today it is on the picnic table there. Um, please, uh, please consider a donation to help. Um, if you'd like to write a check, please make it out to Prince of Peace, and we'll see that it gets there. Thank you for considering that. Normally around this time of year, we would hold our annual Blessing of the Animals service. However, we forgot to schedule it this year, and the Worship and Music Committee decided that instead of trying to put something together last minute, we're going to postpone it until the spring. So watch for a Blessing of the Animals service coming up this spring. I know of at least one person interested, thank you, I know of at least one person interested in joining Prince of Peace right now. If you are interested in joining Prince of Peace, please let me know ASAP so we can get another new members class put together. Today after communion we will have the second of our faith story talks. Um, we're hoping to do one of these a month in which a member of the church comes up and tells us a bit about their story of faith. It's just coincidence that they've both happened at outdoor services, but we are looking to continue to do this about once a month. So if you would be interested in sharing your story of faith, um, please let me know. Uh, and finally, we are hearing from various members of our task force each Sunday uh, for six weeks leading up to the, to the luncheon. Uh, today we have two talks because the one that was scheduled for last week was canceled because of the power outage. Um, so today we have Chip Harrison and Jim Jennings uh, talking. Uh, Chip, why don't you go first? Good morning. Good morning. I'm here today to tell you about something you've already heard about at least once or twice before. I'm here to um, remind you all that as uh, a fundraiser, one of the things our congregation does uh, is um, we sell Weiss cards, uh, Weiss Market gift cards. Now the reason why I'm reminding you about this this morning is because I had this recent epiphany. Uh, that um, as I've learned more about uh, the need to contribute uh, in a greater fashion to, to Prince of Peace, uh, one of the ways that I've learned that my family can contribute more uh, is by purchasing uh, Weiss uh, gift cards. The quick back of the napkin math, uh, my family spends about $1,000 a month at Weiss Market. 
if I were to buy Weiss Market gift cards um, from Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace makes 5% or retains 5% of every dollar that they sell. So in my family, $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year, again, the quick back of the napkin math, I've <coughs> increased or the Harrisons have increased contributions to Prince of Peace uh, in the amount of about $600 a year, spending the same money that I would have spent, you know, regardless. So um, as, a rem as a reminder to all of you, this same opportunity to contribute to Prince of Peace um, you know, that I've taken advantage of or learned how to take advantage of exists um, for you. And the other thing that I just comment briefly on about Weiss gift cards, again, not to disparage any other uh, fundraiser, um, um, because I certainly enjoy fundraisers that other um, community um, uh, organizations, um, you know, take part in, but for every dollar you spend on a Weiss gift card, you get that same value back. If I bought a $50 Weiss gift card, that $50 Weiss gift card is worth $50 when I go to Weiss Market, uh, as opposed to a different type of fundraiser where perhaps the cost of the item that you're buying is inflated um, so that uh, the organization can retain a little. These Weiss cards work in a different way. So for every $50 or $100 I spend to buy the card, I get that same value uh, when, I go to the, uh, when I go to the grocery store. So uh, that's the uh, message that I had to deliver this morning. Um, as part of the task force um, messaging to the congregation, you've all heard um, that one of the th things that's necessary is for all of us to learn how to contribute to the uh, finances of our congregation. Um, or increase our contributions, and one of the ways that I've learned how to do that uh, is through uh, is through Weiss gift cards. There will be somebody available today. It's Kale. Um, after worship today, Kale has Weiss cards available in fifty dollar and one hundred dollar uh, denominations. And if you know, as this program takes off over the next uh, several weeks and months, if we learn that we need different denominations available, you know, we'll certainly um, you know we'll certainly uh, be able to do that as well. Um, I guess any questions, comments, or feedback for the task force, find any one of the members and we'll be happy to, uh, to address. And um, so today after worship here in the Grove, you can see Kale. Moving forward, there will always be somebody available after worship in the Narthex. Thank you. And we thank Weiss Markets because that's where the actual you know, donation comes from. So thank you. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. As you're all aware, a task force has been at work throughout this year studying how we might better align our anticipated revenues with our anticipated expenses. The task force is now presenting some of the key recommendations that will be part of our congregational meeting in November. Today I'd like to outline an important change we are proposing to our mission support strategy. First, let's outline what mission support is and how it works. Mission support is a sum of money that we provide to our local synod on a monthly basis, which is used to fund the operation of the synod, their staffing, and an array of synod-driven ministries. The synod also forwards a portion of these monies to the ELCA, and they use their share to fund the operation of the national church, their staffing, and many ELCA-sponsored ministries. Mission support is a central way that we as Lutherans are all church together. In many ways, mission support being extended to our synod and the ELCA is like your offering is to Prince of Peace. We are not obligated by the synod nor the ELCA to offer any specified amount of mission support just as you as members of this congregation are not asked to, con to contribute any specific amount in offering to Prince of Peace. Instead, we are asked to be generous and to do what we are able. But it's important to realize that by far, your offerings represent the largest single source of financial support for this church and by extension for the Synod and the ELCA. 
About seven years ago, our church council enacted a policy where 10% of the non-designated revenues of this church would be directed to our synod in the form of mission support. Since that time, the 10% guideline has been in effect and reflected in the annual budgets that have been approved. As the task force has reflected on our current overall financial picture, we are now recommending that a new policy be enacted that will reset our mission support contribution to 7.5% of non-designated revenues. We recognize that this will most likely result in a lower total mission support contribution to the greater church, but we believe taking this action at this time will help us to stabilize our financial picture and help ensure that Prince of Peace will continue to be a source of support to the greater church for years to come. It's also important to note that because our mission support policy is based on a percentage strategy, our total contribution will increase as our non-designated revenue increases. Our hope is that we can offset some of the percentage decrease we are recommending if we can realize an increase in overall revenue. Please feel free to see me or any of the task force members if you have questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Chip. Uh, if there are no other announcements I neglected to make, <coughs> let us begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. And as we are outside, I invite you to stand or sit however you desire throughout this service. We're going to be very informal, so remain seated or stand as you desire for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. 
Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite the young and young at heart to come forward for story time. anybody didn't hear. Tina's sitting up there now because Tina's now, as of two days ago, a grandmother. <laughs> so. so Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem, the big city of Jerusalem, teaching in the temple. Now the leaders at the temple were really annoyed about that because that was their job. They thought Jesus didn't belong there. So they said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, this is our job. This is our place. What right do you have to come and be here? And they got into a big argument about it. You ever get into an argument with somebody? Yeah. <laughs> you ever get in an argument? You ever get in an argument with somebody? Yeah. Any of you ever get in an argument? Well, then Jesus said, listen, I'll tell you a story. And I think you might have heard this story already in Sunday school. Jesus told them that once there was a man who owned a vineyard. A vineyard is a place where you grow grapes. And he had two sons, and he told the older son to go work in the vineyard. The son said, no. But guess what he did? Do you remember? What? He, said, he changed his mind and then he did it, right? Yeah. Well, then the man told his younger son, you go work in the vineyard. And what did he say? No. He said yes. But did he go? No. Did you ever do something like that? Did you ever say one thing? and then do something else. Yeah, I certainly have. Well, which one of these sons did the right thing? The one who said no and then did it, or the one who said yes and then didn't do it? Which one did the right thing? What do you think? The first one. Well, Jesus asked the leaders the same question, and they said the same thing. They said the first one, and Jesus said, yep, that's right. Make sure you're doing that too. What you do is more important than what you say. And if you trust me, I will always help you do the right thing. And that's true for us, too. So thank you for your help today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Help us to say yes to him. And help us to do it. Amen. Go back to your seat, thanks. A reading from Ezekiel. Ezekiel challenges those who think they cannot change because of what their parents were and did, or who think they cannot reverse their own previous behavior. God insistently invites people to turn and live. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the tran transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. 
all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from, from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those who be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are gracious and upright, O Lord. Therefore you teach sinners in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. A reading from Philippians. As part of a call for harmony rather than self-seeking, Paul uses a very early Christian hymn that extols the selflessness of Christ in his obedient death on the cross. Christ's selfless perspective is to be the essential perspective we share as the foundation for Christian accord. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfless ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, although being in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but relinquished it all, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work with God's good pleasure. The word of the Lord. The Holy, Go the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Well, Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven? Or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, well, he'll say to us, well, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, well, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. He answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? 
Well, they said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. We live in interesting times. And I don't mean interesting like, oh, that's an interesting painting. I mean interesting like, how interesting it is that the government is almost shut down. Or what an interesting shade of orange the sky is because of wildfires in Canada. That's why there's an old curse that says, may you live in interesting times. The trouble with interesting times is that they're very stressful. <laughs> And times are interesting in 2023, aren't they? People tell me the world is falling apart. People tell me the end of the church is coming soon. People tell me the end of the world is coming soon. So what do we do when we're living in interesting times? Well, let's think about what we did and how we got through interesting times before, because we have. Let me give you some examples. I preach on the same readings every three years. We're in the three-year cycle that comes around every three years. So here's an excerpt from the last time I preached on these same readings. September 27th, 2020. Some of us have had to decide whether to send our kids to school or allow them to learn at home via computer screens. Neither option is great. Some of us have had to decide what to do about our job. Do we trust that our workplace is safe? Or do we trust that we'll be able to live without the income? Some of us have had to choose whether to go to the doctor or not, whether to have a procedure done or not. Is it worth the risk? Remember 2020? That was an interesting time to live. But there's more. Here's an excerpt from the sermon I preached six years ago, October 1st, 2017. I think our whole country has been hyperventilating lately. I think we've all been on edge for a long time now, and it doesn't take much to lead us to hyperventilate. This week, the trigger was the protests on the sidelines at NFL games. Remember that? When some football players were kneeling during the national anthem and it became an enormous controversy? 2017 was also an interesting time to live. But there's more. Here's an excerpt from a sermon I preached 15 years ago, September 28, 2008. One of the reasons choices can be hard is because none of the options are perfect. You might be facing a big decision like that right now in terms of money. What do we do with our money when large banks are failing? And you might be facing a decision like that with the upcoming elections. Remember that, the great recession that began in 2008 when banks kept failing? Remember the presidential election that year between John McCain and Barack Obama? Remember how important and serious that election seemed? It almost seems quaint compared to politics now. 2008 was also an interesting time to live. But there's more. I remember people telling me back in 2003 that the world was about to end. What with the Iraq war and the threat of terrorism everywhere. And in 2001 they told me that after 9-11. And in 1999 they told me that with Y2K coming in front of us. Those were all interesting times to live. And I can remember as a child in the 1980s, being told that the church just isn't what it used to be. We used to have so many kids in Sunday school. We used to have so many people in the pews. The church is dying. In the 1980s, people were saying that. I've been alive for 47 years, and in each and every one of those years, something has happened to make people think it was the end of the church, the end of the world. I have spent my entire life in interesting times. And I didn't even live through Vietnam, or Kent State, or the assassinations of JFK, RFK, and Dr. King, or two world wars, or the Great Depression. I don't know this for sure, but I think maybe we're always in interesting times. But it's so easy to forget that in the crisis of the moment. What's the crisis right now? Congress shutting down the government? Again. COVID making a resurgence? Again. Politics going beyond nasty into downright vicious. Again, none of this is brand new. 
Now, I don't mean to ridicule people who get caught in the worries of the moment. I can relate. I mean, let the power go out again and watch me lose my mind. But I wonder if it might help us to remember that all of this has happened before, or at least something similar has. We got through that, and we'll get through this. And I wonder if our faith might also help. I wonder if our faith in Christ gives us another way to live in interesting times. Throughout his letters in the New Testament, St. Paul tells us that Jesus has already taken care of all of it. All the things that we're worried about, all the interesting things we live through, Christ took care of all of it on the cross. We of all people are blessed. We of all people don't need to be worried when we're in interesting times. Because Jesus took care of it. And in today's second reading, Paul says something very, very interesting. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In you. You too can experience life the way Christ did, in faith and obedience, no matter what comes your way. You can have Christ's mind in you. Now that's ridiculous, we might think. But Paul goes on to say, God is at work in you, enabling you to both will and work for his good pleasure. God is at work in you. Which means Christ's mind is already within you. Even when you are stressed out and overwhelmed by the interesting times you live in, Christ's mind is already within you. That's your birthright as a child of God, made in God's image. So let's see where that goes. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let his mind be in your mind and see the world as though through his eyes. Not through the eyes of fear and worry, not through the eyes of our daily struggles, but through the eyes of Christ. Eyes that are filled with compassion, with sympathy, with joy. Let his mind be in your mind and hear the world as though through his ears. Not through ears that only hear the voices telling us to be afraid. Not through ears that only hear the voices telling us that we can't handle one more thing. But through the ears of Christ. Ears that can clearly hear a voice that is always there. Always speaking quietly amid the din. The still small voice of God saying, You are my beloved child. And with you I am well pleased. Let his mind be in your mind and touch the world as though through his hands. Not hands that recoil from those that are different. Not hands that work for selfish gain. Not hands that close into angry fists. But hands of Christ. Hands that reach out in compassion. Hands that open in love and healing. Hands that stretch so far, so wide. Bringing in everyone. Let his mind be in your mind and praise God as though through his lips. Lips that never spoke a word in anger, except when scolding religious leaders for making their religion too small and narrow. Lips that offered forgiveness and hope to all. Lips that spoke of love and salvation. Lips that prayed and thanked and praised the Lord of all. We may be cursed to live in interesting times, but we are blessed to have the mind of Christ within us. And that is enough. The blessing is stronger than the curse, stronger than any curse. Let the mind of Christ live in you and experience hope and courage and joy and life. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We put our trust in you as we pray for the church. Give bishops, pastors, deacons, and teachers the gift of wisdom and discernment. Guide them in the congregation of St. John Scott Run, in bold truth and faithful witness to you. Merciful God. Lead us in your truth as we pray for creation. Empower us to look to the interest of others as we make choices that impact the environment. Summon us to be advocates for healthy waterways, habitats, and air. Merciful God. <coughs> Lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, and other positions of authority. Give them humble and willing hearts, looking to the needs of others. We pray for also for our enemies. Merciful God. Trusting your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and people who are sick or suffering in any way, including Lois, Lois. Kenny, Kenny, Wayne, Wayne Joyce, Joyce, Ryan, Ryan Shannon, 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 Karen, Karen Renee, Renee, Sandy, Sandy Keith, Keith, Tim, Tim John, John, Janet, Janet Joan, Joan, Edna, Edna Dave, Dave, and the family and friends of Josh, Josh Larry. Larry. Give them encouragement and consolation in your presence. Merciful God. Teach us your paths as we pray for this congregation. Be at work in us. Unite in us your love as we labor together for the sake of the gospel. We rejoice with those having birthdays this week, including Paul Coos III, Kimberly Jennings, Vivian Farr, and Louis Lambert. We wish them a very happy birthday, and may this be a year of good health and happiness. Merciful God. We give thanks for all the saints who died, secure in the knowledge of salvation. Keep us fearless in your faith and certain in your re resurrection. Merciful God. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share with one another a sign of that peace. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in unending song. Holy God, our bread of life, our table and our food, you created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast, and we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want, and by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. You can get your communion cup ready. You can open the bread side. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word. Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ushers are coming around to collect the empty cups. At this time I invite the lay Eucharist visitors who are present to stand. Gracious God, Loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick and homebound. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament, and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence, through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. I invite Marlene to come forward and share a story of faith. answered it and briefly discussed it. Okay. Marley, some people are having trouble hearing you. Okay. Hold in closer to your mouth. Okay. Is that better? Hello? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Yes, thank you. As I read those questions and my answers in the last couple of days, I decided to put my faith story into three small sections. The first section I call Christian Journey. I was baptized at Seibert's Evangelical Congregational Church in Allentown, PA in 1952. My first experience with Sunday School was at the United Methodist Church in Island Heights, New Jersey. From age six on, I attended Sunday School at Friendsville Lutheran slash Reform Church at that time in Center Valley, PA, which was about two miles from my home outside of Bethlehem. 
In the 1950s, one week was a Lutheran service and one week was a Reformed service. However, we did attend Sunday school every week. I completed my two years of catechism classes and was confirmed there by the Reverend Lee Angstead. Butch and I were married in Christ Lutheran Church in Hellertown, BA by the pastor Charles Carlson. We started coming to Prince of Peace in November of 1985 and joined Pop in February of 86. My children attended Sunday school here and were also confirmed here at Prince of Peace. The second section I put as levels of faith. In August of 1954, my mother, who was six months pregnant at the time, was stricken with polio. I was two and a half years old. This disease completely paralyzed her from the waist down. She remained in the hospital for three months until my brother was born. I was taken to my grandparents to stay with them in Island Heights, New Jersey. I don't remember much when I was just that age, but my grandparents lived two blocks from the beach, I lost my place here, it's windy, and I had plenty of cousins and neighborhood children to play with the three years I lived there. My grandparents took me to Sunday school every week and there were a lot of children my age. As I grew older, I remember it was hard on me not being with my parents. My father would come to see me when he could and my grandmother and I would take a bus from Island Heights, New Jersey to Bethlehem every so often. When I was five, I moved back home since I was soon to start school. As much as I wanted to be with my parents again, I felt lost when my grandmother left me to go back to New Jersey. Rehabilitation was very hard for my mother back in the 50s and 60s. It certainly wasn't like rehab today. As I grew up, my parents told me a lot about those first years and it was difficult for the whole family. I'm sure our faith was challenged many times. People would often ask my father, how could something so devastating happen to a young pregnant woman? And my father's reply was, God kept Dot alive and she has a great attitude and we will get through it. And we did. I really can remember him saying this. Even though these early years of my mother's illness, we always felt loved and felt God's presence. Both my parents and grandparents made sure of that. That's why I call this section Levels of Faith. The third section I call Present Day Faith. As I am now in my 70s and there are new health challenges for me, even at this age, I am responsible for the direction of my life and there are still more important choices to make. My faith still influences the way I think and the way I live. In ending my faith story, I know I was blessed to grow up in a Christian home with parents and grandparents who were committed to Christ and who taught my brother and I from a very young age about the God who loves us and what Jesus has done for us. I firmly believe even during all of life's challenges, God is always there. Thank you, Marlene. We appreciate you sharing that story with us. And again, we're looking for others to share their stories in upcoming months. Let me know if you're interested. Yep, we'll now sing our final hymn, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine.
God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God. Anyone who would like to stay for the healing service, just stay where you are. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Anyone who would like to leave, please consider stopping by the, uh, the coffee hour. So we'll begin with a, 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 some brief prayers, and then I will invite you to come forward as you desire. Uh, I will lay my hands on your head and pray for healing, and April will anoint you with, uh, with oil. Our Lord Jesus healed many as a sign of the reign of God come near and sent the disciples to continue this work of healing with prayer, the laying on of hands, and anointing. In the name of Christ, the great healer and reconciler of the world, we now entrust to God all who are in need of healing. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the gifts of life on earth, for our human bodies and all who have, you have created. Bring your saving health to all people. Give skill, wisdom, and compassion to all who provide medical care. Give gentleness and courage to family members, friends, and caregivers, and all who are suffering. God of great and abundant mercy, with your presence, sustain all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to come forward as you desire to receive laying on of hands and anointing with oil. Living God, through the laying on of hands and anointing, grant us comfort in suffering. When we are afraid, give us courage. When afflicted, give us patience. When dejected, give us hope. And when alone, assure us of the support of your holy people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who is a strong tower to all, to whom all things in heaven and on earth obey, be now and evermore your sure defense to help you know that the name given to us for health and salvation is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace, healed and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Don't forget the coffee hour. And if anyone would like to help carry a few things up, that would be appreciated too.